Um, thank you, Tim. I would also particularly like to thank the Fur School for hosting us tonight because they, they've offered this fantastic venue free of charge. So, um, you know, I'd really like to give a uh, heartfelt thanks to that. Um, I'd also like to thank our really high, you know, really illustrious speakers uh, for coming tonight. Uh, uh, over on the left, we've got Lord Stonnell. Um, in some ways, you might say he's a local boy made good. He started off life as a councillor for Hull and then a uh, member of parliament for Stockport. Uh, uh, and they eventually started down in 2015, and from which time he's been in the House of Lords. Um, so he'll be able to give us good insights on what's um, happening in, in, in Parliament. Um, then we've got uh, Jason Hunter. He's an international trade negotiator. Um, so, and he's, he's worked at the highest level. He's um, represented the Hong Kong government in trade negotiations. So really, um, he, he's going to be able to give us a real good insight. You know, what's the difference between Norway, Norway plus, Canada minus, whatever. Um, uh, and then we've got um, we've got uh, uh, Adam Sykes. He's a, a member of, of the council. Adam Sykes. He's a member of the European Movement. Um, he, he's a councillor on, on the world. Um, so he, he'll be able to give us a really good local feel what what the effect might be in the. Um, local area, and he's also a shadow cabinet member for the Environment and Greenbelt on World Council. Um, so, and then we've also got, lastly, but also first, we've also got uh, Christina Tegelow. She's from the, uh, she's the Greater Manchester coordinator for the Three Million, uh, who's campaigning a network and campaigning organisation to guarantee the rights of EU citizens living in the UK. Um, so. Um, and of course, we, we are Chester for Europe. Um, we're a grassroots organisation. There's no money being parachuted down to us from above. We're just a bunch of local people. Uh, we got together, um, six of us got together just before Easter in 2018, and we decided we'd go to Chester Cross and start peaking, speaking to people about their concerns about Brexit. And from that, the organisation, well, we've grown into an organisation. We've got several hundred members. And you know we've got you know we've got a standing committee of 30 or 40 people. And if you do turn up to our standing committee, you get a vote and you get to make decisions. Um, our next our next committee meeting is next Tuesday at Hanky Pankies. So if any of you want to come along, see what's happening, and help make decisions, do come along. Um, I would also say we are a grassroots organisation. Um, so you know there are donation buckets around. Uh, if if you can donate. Or if you want to buy any of their merchandise, uh, these lovely T-shirts only cost 15 quid, and we've also got some white ones which are really are free with a donation. Um, so, on to the format for tonight. We are going to have um, uh, some, if you like, some uh, short talks, 10 to 15 minutes from all our keynote speakers, during which time, hopefully, questions will come to mind. Um, you can write those on the sheets. Um, or you can tweet them uh, or Facebook post them uh, to the hashtag, hashtag CH4EUAsk. Okay? And then we, we will pick up that hashtag, hashtag CH4EUAsk, and we, we will field questions that way as well. So, or the forms. Um, when, the, when the speakers are finished speaking, we will gather up any forms people have, and, and then we will, um, we will try and field all questions that are respectful and interesting. Um, so, um, so, that's, so that's really the uh, format for the, for the evening. Um, Chris Matheson MP did, did want to be here tonight, um, but he, he, he wasn't um, able to attend. So, um, so we're going to start off the night with a, with a short video from him welcoming uh, everyone here. I'm sorry I can't be with you all tonight, but once again let me say how grateful I am to Chester for Europe for the constant campaigning that you and all your members have been doing to maintain the case for our membership of the European Union and to reject the catastrophe that is Brexit. At the time I'm filming this, uh, we still don't know what's going to happen on the next vote that the Prime Minister is bringing forward, but I think you all know that down in Parliament it's absolute chaos. There's a strong and vocal minority who want to have no deal. They tend to be um, on the right of the Conservative Party 
uh, and uh, very rich uh, MPs that chair investment funds, for example, that will crash the economy and make millions from that. MPs who've moved their investment funds uh, out to other parts of the European Union, so it won't necessarily affect them. There's also a growing mood in the, uh, amongst the Brexiteer population in the country to embrace the idea of no deal. It's criminally irresponsible in my view, uh, but even worse than that, they're invoking the Dunkirk spirit, they're invoking Winston Churchill, when we know that Churchill was one of the early supporters of a European Union, because he and his generation, Ted Heath, Clement Attlee, uh, uh, De uh, Dennis Healy, um, had all lived through those wars and had fought in many cases in those wars and knew that bringing Europe together and working closely with people is far better than fighting with them. And that surely is the legacy of the European Union. And to have these Brexiteers invoking um, the Churchill and the Dunkirk spirit in order to embrace no deal, I think, is quite simply repugnant. And we have to stand against that. I'm filming this in a pop-up exhibition in Chester Market where students from Chester University uh, displaying some of their more recent work and you can see behind me that most of them have made up their minds about Brexit. This is a fight for their future. It is a fight for our future. We need to vote for our future. I don't want to be dictated to by some people who are looking back to the 1850s, not even the 1950s, who have some uh, rose-tinted view of a Britain that never actually existed. This is about reality, it's about the future of our young people and I want to thank you again for being an inspiration to me to keep going. And remember, if the worst comes to the worst on the 29th of March, then I'll see you all on the 30th of March to start the campaign for Chester and the rest of the UK to rejoin the EU. I think it's worth it. I know you think it's worth it. Have a great meeting tonight. Well, I think we've got a very clear description of the problem there. Um, so let's start exploring that a bit more. Um, so over now to Christina. Um, yeah. Hello, thank you very much. Yeah, that's, that's all Do you want me to stand up? Stand up. Um, just to say something, I am the coordinator of the three millions for Greater Manchester, but I'm also the outreach officer for the Greater for the three millions uh, for the UK, which means that I have to organise legal advice forum for EU citizens uh, to inform them on their rights. rights uh, and we are helped in this mission by the European Commission representation in the UK that provides us with an immigration lawyer. And uh, it's not just about the settlement scheme and the application for uh, the set of status, uh, but we really inform EU citizens of what the challenges are going to be. So this is uh, for you, if you know anybody that would be interested uh, who, uh, to gather at least a large group of 30, 40 people, European people, uh, to be informed about their rights, they can contact me and I will be out uh, to facilitate the meeting. Um, I prepared uh, just a short speech <laughs> um, which gives you an idea of what Brexit means for European citizens in the UK. And I bet you know most of this, but just to put in a context. In September 1994, I arrived at the University of Manchester to start a nine-month Erasmus project. I was an Italian student exercising my free movement rights. Before starting my Erasmus in the UK, all I needed was an ID and a European health insurance. The day I arrived at the architectural department, I met the other five Erasmus students, one French, two Spanish, and two Germans. And I met the four English students that in a couple of days would have been traveling to Barcelona, they were lucky, to start their Erasmus in Spain. We were all really excited and tremendous happy to be Europeans. During my Erasmus, I met my partner, 
Tom, who is down there, <laughs> a Yorkshire lad, and after my Erasmus year and some toing and froing between the UK and Italy, Tom and I settled in the UK, first in Oxford and then back to Manchester. We now have two girls, they're also there, they say to add beautiful girls, both bilingual with dual nationalities. During the past 20 years, I've been working as an architect, a European exercising my treaty rights in another European country. The only document that I needed to work in the UK was a valid ID. Fast forward to the 2016 Lim campaign and to Boris Johnson's statement that the only way to take back control of immigration was to vote leave. This took us Europeans living in the UK by surprise. Nigel Farage's arguments that the pressure that this large inward migration had put on our schools and hospitals meant that we were now forced to block people from non-European countries who could contribute to the UK from coming here was simply not true. It was a lie. After the referendum, I became involved with the Three Million, a campaign group that was established to protect the rights of EU citizens living in the UK. We knew that the UK could enforce EU rules to remove any EU citizens that after three months of staying in the country were either without a job or without the means to support themselves, the so-called self-sufficient. If they weren't self-sufficient or they didn't work, the Home Office had all the paper to say after three months, you, I'm sorry, you have to go back, you will be deported. And some other European country did so, they did report the people. We knew the EU migrants pay six times more tax and national insurance than the claim in HMRC's benefits. These are actual facts. We know about them. But as we all know now, facts were nearly enough to satisfy the anti-free movement brigade. And the UK voted to leave the European Union on the 23rd of June 2016. Overnight, EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens in the EU 27 found themselves on the front line of the Brexit withdrawal agreement negotiations. During the referendum campaign, we were told by all parties, left, right, and center, that nothing would have changed for those Europeans that were already living legally in the UK. We were told that Brexit was about future immigration, not about us, but we know now that this was a lie. Remember, European citizens like me with permanent resident status who had been working for decades, paying taxes and contributing to this country were not allowed to vote at the European referendum. We didn't have a say, we didn't have a voice. And it's a travesty. They took 21 months, nearly two years, for the UK government to make firm commitments for the protection of EU citizens in the UK. During that time, we were told that we were bargaining chips, citizens of nowhere. We were queue jumpers. We should have been listed by employers and our children's names should have been listed by schools. Now we know that we must register under the settlement scheme by a deadline or we will become illegal, undocumented. And before the three million successful campaigns, 
fine, we would pay, we would pay for this honor. Children, very long-term citizens who came to the UK before Britain joined the European community, people already have a permanent resident card. We all need to apply. It's a shame, shame on them. We are now told that the sector status application is necessary to protect all our current rights. This is another lie. What about the right to vote or stand in local government elections? What about my right to vote in European elections? I couldn't vote for the UK, of course, but I could still vote for the Italy just after being a third nationality country, to vote for the Italian MEP, now I need to travel to Italy. How many people are going to do that, honestly? How many people? What about family reunion rights? We are partnering with the British in Europe organization and we have questions about family reunification, EU citizens' rights, and last but not least, data protection legislations. Under GDPR, EU residents have the right to access the personal data that an organization holds on them. However, there is an exception written into the UK's Data Protection GDPR Act 2018. GDPR rules it says, and I'm quoting, do not apply if the data is being collected and processed for the maintenance of effective immigration control or the investigation or detection of activities that wouldn't undermine the maintenance of effective immigration control. Just to say simple. This exception will affect everyone involved in an immigration case. For example, those seeking refuge in the UK, those affected by the Windrush scandal, the three million EU citizens who will have to submit their application for new immigration status after Brexit. If this bill becomes law, people won't have the right to access their personal data held by the Home Office. European citizens will not be able to see and therefore challenge the information immigration decisions were based on. Individuals involved in migration dispute will not have the right to obtain their personal information from the Home Office. This is the most basic requirement to be able to handle an administrative dispute. Recently, the High Court accepted the three million argument and we have won the right to take the UK government to court over the inclusion of this specific clause in the Data Protection Act 2018. But we have another reason to be worried. The set of status is a digital only system linked to the European passport number in an electronic database. The settlement scheme, the application lives in a cloud, basically. Our concern is that the digital number will not be enough for EU citizens to prove our rights to landlords and employers. We are campaigning for a physical document, a biometric card, just like non-EU citizens. Just think about, I'm, I'm, I'm doing outreach with the Roma communities. Um, think about these people, they, they really want something to show to police people. They really want a document, they really want a card. When, when we explain to these people, you're not going to have anything. Uh, in, it's in the cloud. 
They think, what do you mean it's in the cloud? They, don't, they, don't, they really don't understand. When you talk to an 80 years old Italian woman in Bradford that has been living and working all her life, she was employed here when she was 18, now she's in her 80, and she said, I'm a foreigner in Italy, I'm a foreigner in the UK. What do you say? Well, how do you explain these things? The potential for discrimination is too high to not focus on this urgently. This issue could potentially affect absolutely everyone who only has set to status. But there is a tougher battle that we are fighting and that we can't win on our own. In the case of a people's vote, um, European citizens who are permanent residents in the UK should have the possibility to express their opinion too. <laughs> it has recently been announced that the government is committed to scrapping the rule that denies a vote in general elections and referendum to British citizens who have lived abroad for more than 15 years. But what about us? The Europeans who are permanent residents in the UK. We were denied a vote in 2016 and we are the people whose lives could be most immediately turned upside down by Brexit. We were allowed to vote in the Scottish referendum independence referendum, as were 16 and 17 years old. But we were not able to vote in a referendum that fundamentally affected our rights to carry on our lives in the country we have made home. A people's vote on the Brexit deal will require the UK Parliament to pass a specific referendum law. This law could include provisions for extending the vote franchise to include those that will most directly affected by the decision. As the 3 million EU citizens living in the UK. You got a beautiful slogan. A people's vote. It's gorgeous. It's really nice. But we are people too. Please, just tell the UK government, we are people too. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I think that really underlines you know, the importance of what we're doing and our campaign to stop, to stop Brexit. It's really going to harm people's lives. Um, so uh, next we've got um, Adam Sykes. Um, over to you, Adam. Thank you. Good evening. As I was introduced, I've, I'm a councillor just up the road on the Wirral, but I'm, I'm also actually one of the Conservatives' uh, councillors. Um, I'm one of the Conservatives who obviously supports Remain. Um, and it's nice to be in a room where so many people uh, think the same way as me, because as you can imagine, recently, or over the past two years certainly, I've been in uh, lots of rooms where not many people agree with me, and I'm the one sticking my head up uh, above the parapet. So. It's nice, nice to be in a welcome audience. Um, so I, I was asked today, as, as well as being a Conservative and part Conservative for a people's vote, also being a local to give the local angle. Um, and a lot of people here, a lot of people on the Remain side, as I assume most of you in the room will be on the Remain side, uh, really understand that there's a big economic uh, argument about why we should remain in the EU. And certainly, I think we're going to hear some things about uh, the various trade deals and whatever else uh, are the outcomes of Brexit from some of the other speakers later. But just to put some of the local numbers in front of us, uh, everyone knows just down the road we've got Airbus, 
So Airbus employ directly 6,500 people just at their site. Uh, that's before we take into account any of the other people that are part of the supply chain. Uh, just up the road between myself and, and you here, we've got Ellesmere Port, we've got Vauxhall. Um, Vauxhall in the UK across their two sites have got 3,000 staff that they directly employ. Uh, they've also recently been talking about further job losses. There's already been some job losses at that site. Um, and if we look towards uh, whether we do end up with a no-deal Brexit, which hopefully we don't, uh, Liverpool uh, Riverside, one of the constituencies in, over in Liverpool, that, that's to be one of the worst hit in the North West. So that constituency alone is predicted to lose 1,500 jobs and lots of other North West constituencies around 1,000 jobs each. So under a no-deal Brexit, you, we can clearly see there's a massive economic disaster waiting to happen. Now, I speak to lots of leavers as well, um, and a lot of them, that wasn't that doesn't matter. Uh, and if we look back to 2016, leaving uh, the European Union, how much does the economy matter to you? Only 3% of Leave voters had the economy in their top 10, in their top 10 uh, reasons for why they think it would be a good idea to leave. So the main reasons for them, as we've already said, were immigration and making our own laws. So when we're talking about the big impact that Brexit's going to have, we've obviously got to consider what we just heard then. But often Remainers decide to choose the arguments that they take. They, they choose an economic argument. And listeners are just, uh, sorry, leavers are just not listening. It's like we're speaking two different languages. So when, when we see the People's Vote campaign at the moment, we, ju we just heard lots of this over the recent, over the weekend, we saw Nissan and the way that that news story was interpreted. So from the Remain camp, this is a big example of why Brexit's going to cause untold damage. You could just look at Nissan and all the jobs that we lost. Straight away, uh, the Leave voters come outside, the Leave campaign come out and say, it's because we want to ban diesel cars. And everyone backs into their trenches. They believe what they want to believe. You know, the cognitive bias, as it's called, you only see things that, you, that back up your own argument kicks in, and w there's, it never meets. Our arguments don't hit home. And the reality of that story of Nissan is, it's, it's going to be a mixture of both. Nissan probably wouldn't have been taking that decision if they didn't have the Brexit uncertainty, but at the same time, they, to, they weigh up pros and cons, like any business decision. I've got my own business. You don't make a decision based on one factor. You have to weigh up a range of factors. And of course, it's a mixture of reasons. And that nuance has been lost. Because in this country, uh, I, I consider myself one of these one nation conservatives. And if we go back to what Disraeli said in the mid 19th century, it's like we've got two nations uh, that do not share any of the same habits, thoughts, or feelings. There's, it's like they live on different planets and it's like they live in different zones, and this is what it's become like in the UK. We've got two factions, we've got leave and remain, and at the moment neither side is speaking the same language, as I've said. So as we move towards getting a people's vote and towards winning that people's vote, which are two very different things, and I'll come on to that in a second, we need to start speaking to the other side. We need to start changing minds, and we need to speak their language, and we need to... Uh, set off, you know, go on the attack, if you like, into their camp. So if we come on to how we're going to actually get a people's vote, because that, that's obviously the first step is we, we can have all the campaigns and we can put across all the arguments, but that actually doesn't get us to a people's vote. The only people who can get us to a people's vote are the, the 650 MPs, minus the Sinn Féin who don't take their seats, who sit in the House of Commons. And it's the first stage is to convince those people that we want to take back the control of this situation and we want to have a decision on the future of this country. And the way we need to do that is we need to convince our MPs. And the People's Vote has got a large campaign that they've been running, getting people to contact their MPs, getting pe people to show their support for a People's Vote, to hopefully change the mind of these people down in the Houses of Parliament to say that what we want is a say. Now, I think where we've been maybe missing a trick is that we've, we've focused on the, the Remain MPs. So 
obviously there's a handful in my party, there's a fair number in the Labour Party, and, and I think most bar one of the Liberal Democrats are in favour of, of Remain, and hopefully will eventually back a people's vote, even if they haven't yet so far. But also, we've got to remember that a lot of Leavers aren't getting what they thought they voted for. There'll be a lot of Leavers that either think they were going to get an amazing deal, they think they were going to get this, this brilliant uh, sunlit uplands, um, whatever it was they thought they were going to get out of it. They'll even be the ones who thought they were going to get a complete break and they don't like Theresa May's deal. Now, all of these people may want to say, and it's important that what we try to do at this stage is forget about trying to change people's minds. Let, what we need to do is build a coalition of whatever reason people have got to want a people's vote. We just need to get over the line first. And I think that's important, is whatever we can do to get that people's vote, we do that as the first stage. Trying to convince people of, of what the next step is. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves before we've, we've actually got the people's vote. Because, you know, time's ticking down. There's, there's not much time left at all. You know, it's less than, less than two months now. Um, and, you know, something's going to have to change very quickly. Now, speaking to colleagues down in London, in, in the Conservatives for a People's Vote, there are people who are on the edge. There will, will be people who switch over, and I'm sure that's the same across all the parties. So th they just need to know, they need to have the confidence that people in the country are backing that decision. This so-called will of the people, if you like. Now, the, the polls already say that this has changed. We already see that the polls that are coming out now, that the country would remain if the vote was run tomorrow. But again, it's by such a small margin, the same as it was before, that they still haven't got that confidence to get them over the line. And I, I like to think to break down the, the parliament into three different groups. We've got the people who always voted leave. We've got the people who always voted remain and have stuck to their guns. And then we've got this group in the middle. Um, I, there's, there's lots of examples across all the parties. There's one that springs to mind. Um, he was on national TV the other week. And he said, I don't, I don't believe we should be leave, leaving Europe. I think it's a terrible idea. But I'm going to vote for it anyway because that's what the referendum said. Now, our parliament are meant to be representatives. They're not meant to be delegates, as Edmund Berg once said. They should be making decisions based on what's best interest of the nation, not what they've been told to by their constituency or what they think is best for their party or for their career. And these people who have taken this view, who know that it's wrong, they need to be shown and they need to be contacted. You need to contact your MPs in your area. You need to speak to your family and friends and make sure that the MPs know that you want them to stand up for what they think is right. And there's plenty of MPs that know that it's wrong. There's plenty because the parliament is a remain parliament. So how we can end up with leaving the EU, I've, you know, I've no idea. If they're doing their jobs properly, we wouldn't be leaving the EU because they've been asked to be representatives. So I think we need to make sure that we keep iterating that, reiterating that to them and make sure that they know. If you haven't written to your MP already, and I hope everyone in this room has written to their MP to ask for a people's vote, then that should be the first thing that you do when you leave tonight is send them an email or, or write a letter. Once we've actually um, got through the, the ones that are potentially remain, we've also got the ide ideological referendum people, if you like. So that they ideologically say there's been it was the democratic will of the people and that we need to, in order to carry on with democracy, we have to back that. And it, it's not for career purposes. It, they, they've got a genuine belief in democracy. And the answer to that is how can more democracy be worse than, <laughs> than a fewer amount? So again, we need to focus on those people as well and say, look, there's plenty of reasons why we, the, the last um, referendum was wrong. Uh, the, the various things that was told, the, the, the lies, the, the funding, and the, all, all the various things like that that undermine such a small majority for such an important decision. So again, we've just got to continue to make those arguments. And then finally, as I said before, with the Leave voters, there's the, there's the Leave MPs, and a lot of them don't want to raise a maze deal. And if we can convince them that their best chance to get whatever they wanted is to go to a people's vote, then we should still target those people. I think a lot of the time we see the people's vote as a remain campaign. And most people in this room 
I'm guessing, probably do want to remain, the same as myself. But there is the opportunity to target these Leave MPs and say, look, you know, are you getting what you want from this? Is a people's vote a way for you to have another go, for you to put forward your case again to the people? And it, it may be that that's what just gets us over the line. It gets those one and two, especially potentially the Labour MPs, uh, who, who may be on as uh, fervent as the ERG. Um, so hopefully between that, we can push them over the line. It's really about giving our MPs the confidence to say that you need to be loyal to the country, you need to maintain the sanctity of Parliament, and you, ne you need to give people back the say. So once we've actually got a people's vote, then that's when the real work starts and we need to actually win. Now, whatever the question may be, and we've all probably got our own, reason, our own ideas of what the question should be, which should be remain or remain is my particular choice. Um, but what, once we get there, we need to get out on the streets and actually campaign. And I think the main, re, main changes we need to make from what happened last time is we need to make the positive case, the positive case for Europe, the positive case for peace. So, so when we look back to 28 years ago, we were still in a Cold War with the USSR, and in, that included a lot of our European friends now. The Be Berlin was still divided by a wall, and, and Europe itself wasn't united. So ju just those 28 short years, Europe was a very different place, and the European Union has been a massive part of building that peace across Europe. And that really wasn't spoken about in the previous referendum. All we were interested about was WTO, Norway Plus, and various other trade deals that you know, are important, but it, it was the real social impact that a lot of people voted on. It wasn't necessarily the, imp the economic reasons that people made their decisions. And I think a lot of people here may think that they were concerned about the e economy, but inside, the, you wouldn't be here if it was just numbers. There is a gut feeling that tells you that l remaining is the right thing to do. It's not just about pluses and minuses and you know, numbers in, in the bank account for the GDP. It's a real gut feeling that being, part, being European is, is part of us. You know, we can still be British and European. We can still be Northerners and European. We can still be, for my case, Scouser and European. Um, it's possible to have multiple uh, Person, not multiple personalities, but <laughs> multiple, multiple ideals, I suppose. And the thing that brings us together is that shared values. So when we, we talk about British values and patriotism, most of those values are shared across Europe. So democracy, the rule of law, tolerance, openness. These are the values that I thought were British values. And these are the values that you know, most of Europe agrees with us. There's a couple of examples that don't currently say in Hungary and, and Poland, but they're blips. And we need to have that British voice with those British values at the heart of Europe. Yeah, that's we need to reclaim the word patriotism because one of my favorite quotes is from uh, Theodore Roosevelt. I, I, can't, I can't read it off by heart. But the gist of it is, is that it's not patriotic to stand by a leader. It's patriotic to do what's right for your country. And if your leader and the leadership are doing things that are wrong for your country, then being patriotic is to stand up against them and do what is right. And I think that that, that is what's important. When we're called traitors and you know, told that we're unpatriotic because we don't back what the government is doing, when what the government is doing is wrong for our country, it, it, is be, it is exactly the ideal of being patriotic, to stand up against them. We, we in this room are the patriots. The people who are doing damage to our country are the ones who are unpatriotic. And we need to reclaim patriotism as being about values, about being open to all, and about welcoming people to be part of those values. And anyone can be part of our patriotism. Anyone who comes here, spends their lives here, you know, works, pays tax, has their children here, as long as they're, they're 
willing to be part of our society. We should be welcoming them. And all of us together are a shared, uh, a shared set of values that we, we put forward. And I think that's what true patriotism is, working towards a common goal, not about where you were born and what geographical boundary you're in. And I think that that's something that we need to put forward and reclaim from the people who are using, as we said before, the Dunkirk spirit and World War II and, you know, ridiculous arguments like that. You know, there were so many nations across Europe that were part involved in, in lots of uh, those events. It wasn't just us. We can't, you know, we work best when we work together with others. And Europe is a classic example of how that works best. Um, so that's how we, we put the positive case forward about peace, about working together, about still, you know, we need to keep the economic argument, the fact that as Europe, you know, we're second only to the US, we can stand up against the US and China as when we're part of Europe. We don't need to be dictated to by the US to eat chlorinated chicken when we leave. You know, we can, we can stand up as part of a bigger organization. Um, Europe's also enabled us over the course of the last 28 years to stand up to Russia and to make sure that you know, Russia stays out of the Eastern European countries. Sometimes it hasn't gone as well as we'd, we'd like and hopefully people would stand up a bit more um, in situations like the Ukraine. But we've, overall, it's, it's worked well. But also I think the key point is we do need to address the concerns of the leavers. We do need to address what they were concerned about uh, in the EU referendum. But we don't do what we did last time. When it comes to immigration, we can't be UKIP light. We can't say we'll cut down a little bit of immigration because they'll never be satisfied. They'll never be satisfied unless they get the full clean Brexit that gets rid of all immigration uh, because that's what they want. They see it as something completely wrong. You, ca you can't go halfway. The reality of it is, is we need to refute their argument completely and stand up for the fact that immigration is a benefit to the UK. Our politicians need to stand up and stop cowering behind division and, and using division to make gains politically. We need to stand up and say, no, immigration has been good for the UK. It's brought money, it's brought culture, it's brought a whole range of benefits. And we need to be proud to say that we're happy to welcome immigrants to our country, whether from the EU or elsewhere. And until we start doing that, so I, th I think I'm using a, a, bit, a bit too much of my time, so I'm going to wrap up now. So, so basically, we do need to address the, the um, concerns of the leavers, which aren't just immigration. So it is about domestic policy. We need to be honest about the fact that we haven't invested enough in schools, we haven't invested enough in the NHS, there aren't enough houses. That's not the fault of immigrants. That's the fault of the domestic UK government over decades. And we need to put together a domestic agenda that addresses those issues, that doesn't pass the blame onto a scapegoat that has, has got no, no um, involvement in those situations whatsoever. Thank so, you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we've heard really the positive case for Europe and the importance of touching that emotional heartstring that everyone's got. And you know, um, we've seen the positive of staying in, and we've seen the negative, uh, you know, side of what happens if we leave and the, what the consequences can be. So thank you, Adam. That was really excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so, so now, now we're over to Jason Hunter. He'll. Um, Tell us what all this Norway plus minus and stuff is. Thank you, Jason. Or not. Or not, <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you, folks. So, yeah, my name's Jason Hunter. I love these radio mics, especially when someone's filming live, because it really annoys the videographer when you're moving around. <laughs> 
Um, no, a lot of people know me as uh, the middle guy from Three Blokes in a Pub, the uh, YouTube online video blog, uh, rather than as a former international trade negotiator. Um, I've lived and worked in a dozen different countries, inside and outside the European Union. I've traded on WTO rules, I've traded inside the block, and I tell you what, there's a massive, massive difference. I'll come on to the WTO bit and the economics bit in a little while. But what I wanted to do, first of all, is just see a quick show of hands. How many people in the room read Article 50 before or since the referendum? Well, a good half a dozen. More people than the House of Commons, I think, when they invoked it. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, how could they not have read it? It's only half a page of A4, five short paragraphs. Paragraph three, really simple. All the treaties cease to apply to the member state that's leaving the European Union. Simple. All the treaties cease to apply. And I'll, okay, I'll come back to that as well. Um, so I, want, I do a lot of these talks all over the country, and I wanted to relate a story um, that was really personal to me. It makes me cry nearly every time I, I tell it. Um, the government right now are on a war footing. I don't know if you've noticed. You know, they've, they've created a new ministry for food supplies. That's a minister for rationing in peacetime in the United Kingdom in the 21st century. We now have a minister for food supplies. They're talking about shutting down the M26, 10 miles of major infrastructure in the southeast. 17 miles of the M20 is going to be shut down as a lorry park, a truck park, for goods that are leaving the country and coming back into the country. They're talking about stockpiling food, processed food, six months worth. They're talking about stockpiling medicines. They've instructed the Royal Air Force to put plans in place to find fly around food parcels to various parts of the country post-Brexit. These are government plans. This is not Project Fear. So six months worth of medicines, fine, we'll be fine. But what was the advice that was given to the Department for Exiting the European Union by the medic medicinal companies and the medicine manufacturers? As part of our Three Blokes in a Pub series, we sat down and we talked to one of the major manufacturers. And the four major manufacturers, GlaxoSmithKline, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, they've all been in and sat down with the De Department for Exiting the EU. And before they could even have a discussion, they were forced to sign a single piece of paper, which is a non-disclosure agreement, saying that they will not talk about what's gone on in that meeting. So we work under Chatham House rules, so I can't name the specific company, but it was one of the big four. And she was in the room talking, giving evidence to the government, and all four companies said, you need to stockpile at least six months worth of medicines because they're going to get held up at the borders in order to maintain pharmacies and chemists and make sure that the medicines are in our chemists when our GP gives us a prescription. The government turned around to them and said, oh, we can't afford six months worth. What we'll do is we'll stockpile six weeks worth. Now, this lady's daughter's ill. The medicine that her daughter takes comes from Italy, only from Italy. It's the only place in the world it's manufactured. It currently comes in easy peasy on a GP's prescription. And she's, she knows how serious this is, and she needed six months' worth of medicine because she knows that she won't be able to get it post-Brexit in the, in the no-deal environment. So she went to her GP and said, look, I need six months' worth of prescriptions, and he laughed her at the doctor's surgery. So she went to a private GP because she can, she can afford it, and she got six months of prescriptions for this Italian medication to come into the UK. She's bought herself a new freezer and a new refrigerator at home, and she's stockpiled six months' worth of medicines for her daughter. Now, she's in the know. And the government are not passing on the information, the advice they're being given. All of these non-disclosure agreements from all the different industries, whether it's logistics, whether it's trucking companies, whoever they are, the food manufacturers, the food companies, they've all been sitting down with DEXEU and the government are not passing on this information. So I'm talking at one of these events in Essex, a lady on the front row in her mid-30s. She says, Jason, can you guarantee I'm not going to die because of Brexit? And I looked at her and I said, how do you, how do you mean? She said, well, I take, I've got an um, immune system uh, issue, and I take six different medications a day. If I miss one, I'm dead in 48 hours. She says, three of those medications have a seven-day potency, which means if I take them on the eighth or the ninth day, they're no good to me, and I'm dead in 48 hours. How am I supposed to stockpile six weeks' worth of that kind of medicine? Never mind six months' worth. And I looked at her in the eye and said, you can't. You can't guarantee people are not going to die. And if one person dies as a result of Brexit, the price is just too high. Forget all the econo economic disasters and catastrophes that are coming. But if one person dies because of a political game that our party leaders are playing in Westminster, the price is far too high. But... 
it's okay, folks, because we can just fall back onto WTO terms, right? Easy. We, we trade half, more than half of our exports are all sold under WTO rules, right? That's what we're told by the Brexiteers. It's not true. Not a single country exists on the planet that trades solely under WTO rules. Not a single one. The last one was Mauritania in Africa, and between 1 and 17% of their population still live in slavery. 50% of their exports is iron ore, something we don't have in the UK. And uh, the size of their economy is about 0.26% of the size of the United Kingdom. Even they now have trade deals with their neighboring countries. It's, it's that serious. Nobody trades just on WTO rules. Why? Because it's really, really complicated. We, we currently trade, 50, I think it's about 40, 45, 46% of our trade goes into the European Union. Backwards and forwards, imports and exports. Um, British made manufactured goods, British services, shipped across to the EU, tariff free, friction free, without a problem. We can ship to Madrid or Barcelona, the same as we can ship to Manchester or Birmingham. Makes no difference. That's what being a member of the customs union of the single market means. Easy. But on top of the 27 customer countries we've got in the EU, we also enjoy trade deals with another 60 countries, six zero countries, free trade agreements with other countries all around the world from Canada, Mexico, Brazil, South Korea, even the Japan EU trade agreement covers one third of all of the GDP that exists on the planet. Just one trade agreement. We enjoy all of those as part of our EU membership. In addition to the FTAs, we also have dozens upon dozens of what they call cooperation agreements and framework agreements that make it easier to trade with countries where we don't yet have a free trade agreement, like the United States of America. The USA is our biggest target um, destination for exports outside the European Union. 22%, I think it is, of all of the products that we export out of the UK go to the USA under all of these cooperation agreements that have been signed over the last 20 plus years. We lose all of that. Paragraph 3, Article 50, all of the treaties cease to apply. That means everything stops for the United Kingdom, 11 p.m., 29th of March next year. So how do we get into the WTO? Well, we're already members. We're one of the founder members. Um, the WTO was only founded in the mid-1919s, but it's based around something called GATT, G-A-T-T, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which are the basic set of foundations for trade around the world. It's like uh, when, the, when the Brexiteers say you could just fall back onto WTO rules because all of the world trades under WTO rules, well, they kind of do because it's the foundation for all of the trade agreements that we have. It's like saying, well, we all live in houses or bungalows or flats. And what we're going to do is we're going to knock down our house down to the foundations and say, yeah, but it's okay because all the other houses have got foundations, but we just don't have a house left anymore. <laughs> That's the free trade agreement that goes on top of the foundations. So in order to be able to trade freely, if you like, under WTO, the first thing you need to do is file what's called a schedule of your import tariffs on goods that are being sold into your country that you're buying from around the world. So say, for example, we need 200,000 tons of a particular grade of steel in the United Kingdom to maintain our manufacturing industry, um, but we can make 100,000 tons of that particular grade of steel ourselves. So what we would do is we would have a very low tariff on the first 100,000 tons of imported steel to maintain our car manufacturers and construction companies. And then anything above 100,000 tons, you put on a much higher tariff on top of that to try and discourage other company, countries from selling into the United Kingdom to protect your companies that are making that steel that you need. Now bear in mind there's over 3,300 different grades of steel. And you need to do that calculation about what we make and what we need and what the tariff you're going to apply and what the quotas are going to be for all of those different grades of steel. And steel is one of about 4,500 product nomenclature or product groups that you need to put a, a schedule of tariffs against. So you've got 4,500 different product groups. One of those groups has got over 3,300 different grades within it. We need to put that all together in a schedule of tariffs. We send it off to the WTO in Geneva and the World Trade Organization, 164 countries around the world, all look at it and say, yep, we agree with most of that, but this bit's not right. We, we want to be able to sell you more than 100,000 tons of this because we used to be able to do that before with our EU trade agreement. So then they can put, it, put us in dispute and say, well, hang on, that's not right. Hold on, hold on, that's not right. And then when we find ourselves in dispute, it's very difficult for us to then go off and negotiate new trade agreements with somebody else when you're in dispute at the WTO. However, in his infinite wisdom, Liam Fox, our Secretary of State for International Trade, instead of doing that tariff calculation and producing a schedule of tariffs that's specific to the United Kingdom, he went to the EU website, copied and pasted 
the document off EU letterhead of paper and stuck it onto British government, International Trade Department letterhead of paper and sent it into the WTO. When it arrived in Geneva, they laughed. They could not believe how lazy he'd been. They said he didn't even change the currency symbol from a euro to the British pound. I, I kid you not, we were there back end of December. I spent two, two days solid in meetings in Geneva at uh, the back end of last year, talking to them, some of the leading international trade experts in the world. And they, we, we talked about Liam Fox a fair bit. And they said, well, a couple of years ago, he could be forgiven for making the political statements he was making about just rolling over all these trade deals and we'll have 40 new trade deals the next day ready to be rolled over. He said he could be forgiven for making those sort of political statements because back then he didn't know what he was talking about. They said he's been back and forth to Geneva eight times in the last couple of years, sitting in the same seats you're sitting in right now, Jason. And we've told him that what he's saying is not true, not feasible, not viable. And the other countries that he's saying will just roll over trade deals have told us that they will not do it. So now when he makes those same political statements, he knows he's lying to you. And I'm like, wow, British politician lying to us. Fancy that. Um, so, I mean, they gave us a couple of analogies when we were in Geneva. And they said... Imagine you're driving down the motorway or the autobahn at 100, 100 miles an hour and your car's in sixth gear, your husband or your wife sitting in the passenger seat, your kids are sitting in the back, and you're flying down the motorway in sixth gear, 100 miles an hour, you put the clutch in, take the car out of sixth gear, put it into first gear, and then let the clutch out. They said, that's what Britain is trying to do to its economy in the United Kingdom. It will screw the engine of the gearbox. You will be on the hard shoulder. You're sitting there trying to rebuild your economy. But it's so badly damaged, it's going to take a massive amount of money and a massive amount of investment and a massive amount of time to catch up. He said, at the same time, all the other countries in the world are flying down the autobahn 100 miles an hour still because they haven't deliberately crashed their car. They deliberately haven't destroyed the economy. We said, well, what do you mean when you say destroy the economy? They said, well, other countries see the European Union like a bait ball of fish in a David Attenborough documentary swimming around protecting each other from the sharks that are swimming around outside. The other countries are the sharks, and we're part of the EU being protected. Yes, they're protectionists, the European Union. They protect us. So the other countries are waiting for a big fat fish to swim away from the protection of that bait ball so that they can swoop in and take bites out of your economy. They said, the first um, industry sector they're coming after, or they're telling us they're coming after, is your agri-food sector. Not, not just agriculture, not just your arable farmers, your dairy farmers, and your meat farmers. He said, but all the downstream processes as well. If you take your dairy farmer, he's not just making milk and selling milk, making milk, he's throwing cows at making milk. But, um, he's, the, the milk's product produced, but it's not just selling milk, he's creating a side industry making butter, another side industry making cheese, another one making yogurt. And the yogurt manufacturer, he's, got, he's creating sub-industries in itself there with a little plastic pot that you put the yogurt in, and the silver foil manufacturer, he's making the lid that goes on the plastic, the, the yogurt pot. The cardboard manufacturer, the printing company that put the, the advertising on the outside of it and wrap it all up, the logistics companies. 3.5 million people work in the United Kingdom agri-food sector, and they said under every single model we've run, and this is one of the most wealthy organizations in the world. Every single model we've run, your agri-food sector has between 18 months and two years to survive as you know it today. 18 months to two years, under every model, with a withdrawal agreement, without, with a transition agreement, without. That's 3.5 million households living off those, in that industry. Imagine if we lose, imagine if they're only a quarter right, and we don't lose three and a half million jobs just in the agri-food sector. What if they're only a quarter right? That is hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of households with no income. How are they going to buy their food? Where are they going to buy it from? Especially if the government are worried that the supermarkets are so worried the supermarket shelves are going to be empty that they're stockpiling food and instructing the Royal Air Force to deliver food parcels, put plans in place to deliver food parcels across the country. That's just, just unthinkable. Unthinkable. So we talked about the automotive sector and we touched on Nissan. And, people, and the Brexiteers are saying, oh yeah, Nissan are going because nobody's buying diesel cars anymore. But Nissan are not stopping building these cars. They're just going to build them in Japan. Yeah? Where Japan have this free trade agreement, tariff-free access to the European Union. It's not like they're stopping building the cars. People are still buying the cars. These are X-Trails. And also, if it's diesel, why are Jaguar Land Rover making the new electric Jaguar in, in Slovakia? Why is the Mini Cooper, moving, the electric Mini, moving away from Oxfordshire and being built abroad? That's not because of the diesel engines, it's because of Brexit. And these were all warnings that were given to us before. Sony have already gone, Panasonic have already gone. Barclays Bank have just moved £166 billion out of the United Kingdom and stuck it into Dublin. 
Money's moving out of the country faster and faster all the time. And the other thing that hasn't been considered by the government as yet, I believe, am I okay for time? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, good. Um, uh, when these uh, foreign companies invest in the United Kingdom, they sign what's called a bilateral investment treaty, a BIT. And in that agreement, it'll be between the government and, say, Nissan, and say, we're going to invest hundreds of millions of pounds into Sunderland, we're going to create all these jobs, we're going to pay all this corporation tax, but we want a three- or five-year hol tax holiday to start with so we can get some of our investment back. And there's also clauses in there that say things like, if the government policy changes from what it is today, then we are allowed to sue you as a British government as a result of your policy change for our losses. We've had over 1.3 trillion pounds worth of foreign direct investment in the United Kingdom, 400 billion from the European Union, E27 countries, 300 billion from the USA, and we know how much they love to sue, and another 300 plus billion pounds from, from other countries around the world, including Japan. All of these companies have an opportunity to look at, go back and look at their BIT, their Bilateral Investment Treaty, and say, look, I put this money in your country on the basis that I could use you as a springboard into the largest single market in the world, and now you've just pulled the rug out from underneath my business. Scary stuff. And the government haven't even considered that yet, but I bet you the general counsel have of all these foreign companies that are over here. Then you look at the um, banking sector in the United Kingdom. Did you know that 17% of all of the banking deposits in banks in the UK are held by the other EU27 countries. That's another trillion pounds worth of banking deposits. Why would they leave that in a third country post-Brexit? I certainly wouldn't, especially after the way we've treated them for the last two and a half years. You know, the, the bank, the, the cash bailout, taxpayer bailout to the banks in the 2008-09 financial crisis, the worst financial crisis this country has seen in peacetime, was 258 billion pounds. Imagine if the EU27 just pulled out half of the banking deposits. That's double the crisis that caused 10 years of austerity. Scary stuff. So um, I was going to talk a little bit about British manufacturers and exporters. So say I'm making a widget, like a microphone stand, and I'm selling it to Mexico today under one of our free trade agreements, or Brazil, or Japan, or Canada, or somewhere else. I'm selling it for £100 to my customer over there. And he's quite happily buying from me every single month, placing orders, I'm shipping them back out, it's all going, great, all going great. Go back to the WTO rules, Mexico and Canada and all the other countries in the world, they've filed their schedules of tariffs with the WTO, they've all been approved by the other 164 countries. So I know when I sell my widget post-Brexit under WTO terms, my customer in Mexico is now going to have to pay £1.25 because he has to add his import tariff onto everything he buys from the United Kingdom because that's the way WTO terms work but not just Mexico. All 164 countries around the world will have to apply their schedule of import tariffs to everything that we export out of the United Kingdom. Not only will he have to pay more for that widget, he will also have to prepare a whole load of new paperwork, other import taxes. He'll have to pay put forward uh, safety declarations, customs declarations, freight forwarders. British companies will have to do the opposite at this end when we try and export out. Why will that customer in Mexico continue to buy from that British company post-Brexit when he can still buy that widget for £100 from any of the other countries in the world where he's got a trade agreement? Why would they? Think logically, there's no reason on earth why they would deliberately want to pay more to buy a, and make it more complicated to buy from a post-Brexit Britain. So we, we all heard about Project Fear <laughs> during the referendum campaign and since. Uh, where we are right now is facing Project Catastrophe. It's far, far worse. I've just scratched the surface of some of the things that we've talked about um, this evening, and I, I could talk for another three hours and tell you some more, but it's, it's, it's pretty scary. I'll look forward to the Q&A, though, afterwards. But I just want to touch on that final point. We mentioned democracy um, earlier. We had, we had a democratic vote in 2016, right? June 23rd, 2016, we had a democratic vote. No, we didn't. All of the major campaign groups, all of them, including Stronger In, have been successfully prosecuted for breaking electoral law. They've been fined and penalized for it. The leadership of the Vote Leave campaign, including their, their uh, communications coordinator, have ad repeatedly admitting, admitted they deliberately lied to the public. The Leave EU campaign leadership sat in a parliamentary select committee and gave evidence under oath that they deliberately lied to people to get them to vote to leave the European Union. There's overspending left, right, and center. There's 8.3 million pounds, supposedly, from Aaron Banks that was donated to the Leave campaigns. Six million of that was a loan. So it wasn't declared as a cash donation. How, does, how is a single issue referendum campaign group 
supposed to pay back a £6 million loan. They've got to sell a lot of badges at a pound each at a profit to make £6 million to pay it back. It was never intended to be. And nobody knows where it really came from. Supposedly from the Isle of Man, but nobody, all the fingers are pointing towards Russia. The Metropolitan Police are investigating a variety of different law, break, law breaches from the referendum. The National Crime Agency, for the first time in British electoral history, are investigating an election. If anybody thinks any of that is okay, they don't believe in democracy anymore. They just believe in Brexit. And that's my two penneth. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. I, I'm glad he's not the last speaker, or we'd all be going home depressed. But, uh, so hopefully now uh, Lord Stonnell will shed some light and hope for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noel, and it's uh, good to be back in Chester. We moved away 30 years ago, but uh, our children did go to Newton School just down the road. I'm just establishing my local credentials before you start actually throwing things at me. Um, okay, the, the fact of the matter is that the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland will leave the European Union without a deal in 54 days unless something changes. That is the situation. And we can talk about whether the referendum was a dud referendum or a good referendum, whether people were misled, whether the Russians were. The fact of the matter is UK law now mandates that and the fact that Article 50 expires at 11 p.m. on the 29th of March, actually it expires at 12 p.m in Europe, but of course the rest of Europe, that they're an hour ahead of us, so we don't get it till 11 p.m. That's, if you're wondering why it's a funny time, that's exactly when it'll happen. And it will happen unless something happens. Something political happens unless Parliament does something to stop it. So what are those things? Well, one of the things Parliament might do is agree to the Prime Minister's deal or some version of it in which case we will leave the European Union, but it will be on the terms that she has negotiated. Another thing that might happen is that Article 50 might be extended so that it doesn't take effect on the 29th of March. Technically, that's not exclusively in the hands of Parliament because the other 27 countries have got to agree to it. But there's every sign and every signal from Europe that they would willingly extend Article 50 in order to avoid a chaotic departure of the United Kingdom. It still wouldn't solve the question or answer the question of what was going to happen, but more time would be bought. Another possibility, at least on paper, is that Parliament's should simply vote to withdraw Article 50. Yeah, yeah. That is in the hands of the United Kingdom alone. It doesn't require anybody else's permission or negotiation. It can simply be done. And I'll say something about the implications of attempting to do that in just a minute. And of course, the solution that I believe is the right one is that we should indeed suspend Article 50, delay it. We should have legislation for a people's vote and then we work very hard to win that people's vote. Now, Before getting to that, I want to add a couple of points to what's been said before. I mean, uh, as a parliamentarian, I get quite a lot of mail about Brexit. As a member of the House of Lords, you're actually insulated from a large amount of it, but you still get some. And I and other parliamentarians were quite baffled about uh, 18 months ago now, I suppose, to get a, a letter from the people who make Mr. Kipling's wonderful cakes saying that they were extremely concerned about the implications of a no deal. 
and we kind of looked at each other a bit. They don't export their cakes. They don't import their cakes. What's their problem? Well, their problem is a very simple one. They foresee every heavy goods vehicle in the United Kingdom being parked on the M20 and the M27. Those lorry parks are going to be full of something. And they think they might be full, commandeered even, from Mr. Kipling. So don't imagine that it's a narrow problem relating to blocking up a motorway with a few lorries. Those lorries come from somewhere. They're driven by people and they have to be inspected by people as well. So there's plenty more and indeed we could easily spend another hour going into all the things which are wrong. In fact, I had some stuff about the WTO and New Zealand and how it all worked, but I, I've come to the conclusion listening to Jason that you'd all burst into tears if you did that. So, so let's, just, let's just skip that bit. But these trade deals we're going to do, I mean, look at the world's biggest economies apart from the European Union, the United States. Okay, I don't know what kind of chicken you want to have, but you can imagine that Mr. Trump is going to want to have a deal, the best deal in the world he's going to offer us on the chicken. They want to sell agricultural products, that's what their big surplus is, that's what they want to sell to us. So what's that deal going to look like? And how are we going to withstand that if we want a big deal? Mind you, don't give up all hope. We have actually this today, uh, signed memorandum of agreement with one of our big export partners, the Faroe Islands. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm reliably told that that is 0.4025% of the UK economy is the Faroe Islands economy. Um, or, of course, uh, another big economy in the world, obviously, is China. Well, Jason mentioned steel. There's a huge dispute uh, about what China is allegedly doing, dumping their steel all over the world at low prices and driving steel producing countries out of their businesses. The European Union is one of those which is leading the fight on that and you've probably heard Mr. Trump talk about that. So if you want a steel industry in this country, you don't want to be doing a bilateral deal with China because that's going to be right at the top of their list. Mrs. May went to the third large economy where everybody says, why don't we? And that was India. And she talked to Mr. Modi, who's the Prime Minister of, Minister, uh, uh, of India. And he said, yes, we'd offer you a wonderful deal. Can we start by talking about visas for Indians to come to the United Kingdom? And the UK delegation went a little bit cool at that point. And it's one of, the th one of the lies, if you like, that was propagated during that referendum, particularly amongst ethnic and minority communities, was that if you vote leave, it will make more space for migrants to come from outside the European Union. And you sometimes find people on the doorstep who believe that that is one of the outcomes that's going to come. Now, I haven't mentioned Russia because uh, I don't think we'll probably get a trade agreement on Novichok. Um, but when you look at the big economies of the world and the politics of those big economies and what it is they are big about and big for and what, I mean, do you want to rely on Russian oil and gas, never mind the actual uh, other sort of chemicals? None of those look very attractive at all and it's very difficult to see why we would do it. Um, so, what about Mrs. May, Mrs. May's deal itself? Now, in February of last year, uh, I was invited with other parliamentarians to go and have a look at the government's secret evaluation of the impact of Brexit. And we, we, we had to book an appointment. We went over to the Treasury building on the other side of Whitehall. We had to hand our phones in and uh, not take any cameras or recording devices or we could make notes. We went into a fairly small room. There were two civil servants sitting at desks uh, making sure we didn't do anything naughty with the information we were given. Um, and there was the, the British government's assessment. Now the most powerful bit of that assessment is actually in the public domain, although they wrapped it up rather a lot. They had compiled 13 estimates 
made by uh, world bodies worldwide on the impact on the UK economy of Brexit. And they presented it all on one A4 sheet of paper. It's a pity I couldn't get you a photograph of it. But if you can imagine 13 vertical bars with a mark on to show the effect on the UK economy for staying in the EU, having a Norway-style deal, or having a Canada-style deal, each of these different organizations, the, the World Bank and various think tanks in the UK, and so on, had made their estimates. The scary thing is that all of those 13, the highest mark you got for the economy in the future was if you stayed in the United Kingdom. Not one of those 13 ways of estimating the UK's performance if we leave suggested that we'd be better off if it was Norway or better off if it was Canada or indeed, not that it had then been invented, better off than with Mrs. May's deal. Mrs. May's deal is probably somewhere between Norway and Canada uh, in terms of horror and awfulness. The fact of the matter is that the best deal is the one that we have got now. And so I'll use my remaining... <laughs> I'll use my remaining time to, to say what I think has got to happen. Um, First of all, we have got to extend Article 50. Secondly, we've got to hold a people's vote. Thirdly, we've got to win a people's vote. And fourth, we then withdraw Article 50 and resume our membership of the European Union. So how can we do that when Parliament is so obviously polarised and divided? It's not divided between the parties. Indeed, one of the big criticisms of the current uh, performance of Parliament is that you can't really tell if we've got a loyal opposition or not. The split is within the political parties and it's not just confined to the government and the opposition. Uh, just think about representation for Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland voted to remain and it's represented in Parliament by 10 MPs who are ferocious Brexiteers and by seven Sinn Féin members who never attend Parliament at all. Where is the voice of Northern Ireland in all of this? <laughs> and it's also true that there's a majority of MPs, a clear majority of MPs, who want to remain in the EU. And it's also even more true in the House of Lords that there's a clear majority of members of the House of Lords who want to remain in. So what is the problem? And the problem, of course, is the referendum result in 2016. And we can whinge about that, and there might be very good reasons to whinge about it. But I think we also need to recognise a few hard facts. If you take Chester constituency, which is what we're in now, more people voted in 2016 in the referendum than had voted in the 2015 general election in Chester, and more people voted in 2016 in the referendum than went on to vote in the surprise general election in 2017. It was the biggest turnout of voters in Chester constituency ever. It was the biggest turnout of voters in every constituency in England ever. So, if we're going to defy it, we better know exactly what we're doing. And I met plenty of people. I have subsequently met plenty of people, people in their 50s and 60s, who had told me, told me that they had never voted before. And all the evidence suggests that they will never vote again until we have a people's vote. And then they'll be back. So, it is a legal possibility, it is a legal possibility for Parliament to simply withdraw Article 50. But I think it would be politically even more destructive of our democratic system than we can possibly imagine. And I don't want to paint an unduly graphic or dramatic picture about that, but anybody who thinks that Parliament, particularly Parliament in its present state, could ever summon up the courage or 
perhaps we should say the complete foolhardy stupidity of voting to withdraw Article 50 without consulting the people, I think has rather misread the situation. So I think we have to say, we have to acknowledge, and indeed it's why we are arguing for a people's vote, that what the people commissioned, the people must have a voice in changing. And that's why we need that people's vote. And that people's vote needs to say May's deal, let's assume she has one, against remaining. And I can tell you that from the moment when that decision is taken by Parliament, or possibly by the government telling Parliament that it intends to do it, it's an 18-week process. From the decision to do it, to passing the legislation, to conducting the campaign, to polling day, you can fit it into 18 weeks you'll have spotted that that takes us well past the 29th of March. And that's why step one has got to be extending the application of Article 50. So I can tell you that there's legislation on the shelf, pre-packed, ready to go. <clears throat> it won't suit everybody. In fact, I know it won't suit Christina because to get it through, this parliament is not a simple job and the simplest job is to repeat the legislation of 2016 and that means no 16 year olds and I'm afraid it means no European citizens either because parliament will not vote for that. Lots and lots of reasons, lots of people who might vote for a second referendum will not vote for changing the electorate to do that. No doubt you might want to ask some questions, but that's what I came here to tell you. To say it how it is. Um, so, um, and by the way, no three-way choices. Uh, just, just imagine if it was 33, 33, 33. I don't think that solves anybody's problem. And I'm certainly not speaking on the platform when we come to the third referendum if we do it that way. So then there's winning the people's vote. And th this is where I, I really absolutely agree with my conservative colleague here uh, about the reality of that. The Leave, the Leave campaign's got a very simple slogan. And that is, tell them that you meant it. That's all they need. Tell them that you meant it. They don't have to go back to the bus. They don't have to do anything. They just have to say, you were right the first time, folks. And we are not going to win the argument by saying, no, you weren't, you were wrong. If we're going to fight an argument on whether they were right or wrong, we're going to lose that people's vote. So all the blood and the sweat and the tears in Parliament giving us a people's vote will not mean that we stay in the European Union. And nor will we win it by saying Britain's too weak to stand alone. Britain isn't too weak to stand alone, but we're too sensible to stand alone, and that is surely the crucial point. We belong to an, a country which prides itself on its common sense, on giving leadership, on showing the rest of the world how to behave responsibly and properly, not just in what we do economically, but in, in our whole set of values, and, and again, very ably expressed. It's not because we're too weak to stand alone, it's because we're too sensible to stand alone. And we're certainly not going to win a second referendum or a people's vote or whatever you want to characterise it as by saying that politicians and bankers and experts know best. Well, it's true, but that's not a winning argument. So what is a winning argument? Well, a winning argument is certainly that Britain's, Britain's power and Britain's influence has been terribly wasted and damaged in the last two years and it's time to rebuild and renew what we do at home and what we do overseas. And it's about Britain's health and wealth. And by health, it's not just NHS and a bus with a figure written on the side. It's a lot of other things which go with health, like air quality and climate change and working conditions and job security and skills and education. That's all about creating a healthy society and making sure that 
we build it up. And we need to be saying that that's what's going to happen. We need to reverse that argument about a Brexit dividend. We actually know now that there's a Brexit loss. So the argument for a people's vote is that we're going to get those extra services which Brexit threatens to cut away. And we need to have a country which is wealthy and prosperous and do what we need to do to achieve that, because without that, you can't pay for the social justice. And again, the alternatives are there to be seen. Uh, I don't know if you've examined either India or Russia or the American healthcare system, but you're rather better off with one which is based on Western uh, European values. Um, and yes, okay, there's some stuff to do about changing the EU, and it will never go back to being the same, and we shouldn't say that. We shouldn't pretend that that's what we're looking for. But for goodness sake, let's not fight a campaign which says, don't worry, folks, we're going to move the European Parliament uh, back to Brussels. Uh, let's focus on the things which actually matter to people, the, the things which actually matter to our country, the things which matter to us in our local communities. So there you are. I think there's um, four steps to a safer world. And what can you guys do? Well, I... I can tell you that MPs and parliamentarians have been very impressed by all the campaigners outside Parliament. Um, the, the flags outside the TV uh, sheds have been getting taller and taller. There was somebody walking along with, I think it must have been an adapted fishing rod, which was rather taller than this room with an EU flag on it uh, this morning. So, and it, well, the weather wasn't good for that either. So, yeah, anything that makes it visible and clear what we... What we believe and what we want to get is, is right. Uh, certainly visit your MPs. Don't just write to them. Book an appointment and go and talk to them uh, because that is effective. I mean, I speak as somebody who was an MP for 18 years um, and uh, there's a kind of a, a, a descending order of effectiveness. If people come and see you, you know they, they think about it seriously. If they write you a letter you know, with actual pen and envelopes, then you know they're taking it seriously. If they send you an email, you may yeah, maybe, but after you've read 250 exactly the same, some of which say, I feel very passionately about this and start off as dear fill in name of MP. And I've had those. Um, so they get devalued. So make sure that you are really getting through to your MP. And I absolutely agree, talk to those who you know don't agree with you. Um, that's what we're going to have to do when we get to the people's vote. So let's start now with those MPs. Letters to newspapers and phone, phone. what about all those radio phone-ins? Are you actually dialing in and saying your bit on these? There you go, an easy shot, no problem at all. You'll drive them mad in the studio, not another of those remainers, but the fact of the matter is, it's effective and it helps to set a climate in the radio studios, if not on the airways, about the uh, enthusiasm and support that you're offering. And social media, of course, street stalls, of course. And if you happen to be inside a political party, for goodness sake, make sure your party is doing the right thing. There's plenty of scope for the political parties to... Um, adapt what they are currently doing to more clearly represent the view of Remainers. I'm trying to put that as diplomatically as I can. As a Liberal Democrat, I don't want to stir the water too much. But there you go, four steps to a safer world. Um, it's four steps to a Britain which can lead in Europe and lead internationally and take our values to the four corners of the globe the way that we believe they should be. And it's a very important four steps to make sure that we are turning our minds to building a country and building a society that we can be proud to live in. Uh, there's just 54 more days. We'll be doing what we can in Parliament. But you need to give us a really vigorous push. Please get going. Thank you. It's, it's always nice to finish on a, on a speech with a bit of hope and certainly some homework for us all to do. 
uh, when, when we go home, but we aren't going home yet because um, there's some uh, questions we've got um, from, from Twitter which we will use, but also if you have filled in any questions on your forms, please hold them up and um, they, they, will be, they will be collected. Um, but I'm only going to start um, with one question from Twitter and it says, what plans did the Brexit did the Brexit leaves set out to do? Oh, so um, I can't read that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have gone to spread, sir. <laughs> yeah, all right. So it's basically uh, what 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 plans ha have, have the Brexiters got for the Irish border, and how would leaving the EU disturb the Good Friday Agreement? Um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to come to Christina for that to start off with. Well. We know how important it is for peace to be inside Europe. And it's not peace just for um, the UK, but we, we look at Ireland, all the Isle of Ireland, uh, as a massive issue. And in, in, this, in all these negotiations, it's amazing how the European Commission and the European Parliament has taken a stand. The backstop agreement uh, is an insurance policy. Wouldn't you want to have an insurance policy if you know that something is so crucial, so pointing? So, uh, in a few words, I would say that uh, I really don't understand, personally, from a point of view, I really don't understand why um, the Leave voters uh, would not support an insurance policy as well. It's something that we should all uh, be protective about it. No, you are Irish. You know what it's about. You, you told me that you were leaving on the border and going in and forth. I mean, we know what it's going to be. I, I'm 46. I, I know what it was about. We used to hear the news uh, about Ireland. We knew, uh, when I left the Erasmus, uh, was the same day that the bomb exploded in the Ardeal Centre in Manchester. It was the 14th of June, and I was leaving Tom, my, my future husband, there, because the, the coach session is really a five minutes walk from there. And I remember when I arrived at Heathrow Airport, listening to the bomb, to what, Heathrow Airport was in chaos, there were images all over. And uh, my first thing, we, we didn't have mobile phones at that time, but nobody had it. I didn't know how to contact Tom, so I had to call some, uh, some mates, some colleagues from the university and see, has Tom been back? Has he, has he returned? Is he home? Can you let him know? I'm at the, I want to know where he is. It was just tragic. And this was the United Kingdom. It wasn't a fair world country. I mean, we were talking, are we really seriously thinking that we should go there again? I mean, wake up. It, the backstop has to be there. I'm just shocking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's, that's, thank you. I, I think that's a really thorough answer from Christina, and it really, I think, it deals quite effectively emotionally with the, uh, with the, you know, the, the importance of, of that. Um, um, there's a there's a whole load of questions, um, and we've we've got a limited time, so I'm going to go um, on to something that might be quite, I think, is quite important, and it's um, it's uh, from Steve Patterson. And it is, I will address it to, to Lord Stonnell. And is it, how do you nudge people who seem immune to facts? <laughs> facts. <laughs> well, there's a kind of a joke answer, which is I've spent most of my political life trying to deal with that problem. But, um, no, I mean, the, the, the reality is that the people, uh, if I go back to my 50 and 60 year old man who, who who never voted before and probably will never vote again. He voted because of his guts and his heart, not because of his head and his pocket. Um, and we've got to make sure that we are talking to people in things which get to their guts and their heart and not only about things which get to their heads and their pockets. And I think that's, that's the winning hand and we shouldn't be in any doubt that when we get a people's vote, the Leave, Remain, uh, the Leave campaign knows that and they will be going for people's guts and hearts. 
So you have to fight that with guts and heart, not just with head and pocket. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, do you want to say anything to that point as well? Um, I, I totally agree. I mean, it, it's hearts and minds. That's how they won the referendum campaign. Unfortunately for me, I'm a kind of a facts and evidence kind of guy. <laughs> Um, if you go back to the EU Withdrawal Act, just touching on the first question very briefly, the EU Withdrawal Act that received royal assent in July last year, uh, Section 10.2b has actually made it illegal for a UK government to put any kind of checks, measures or controls on the border on the island of Ireland. This is great news. The problem they've created for themselves is if you're not checking, measuring and controlling the volume and the value of goods that come in and out of your country across your borders, then you cannot legally trade under the WTO terms and you can't negotiate new free trade agreements with any other country in the world because you have to know what quotas and what volume and what tariffs to apply to it all. So the government really have backed themselves into a corner over the Irish border and it is absolutely categorically fundamental that that backstop remains in there and we never put a border back up in the island of Ireland. I've got a question here from Sue Proctor for, for Andy, and it's um, as, as, a, as an active politician seeking an election, should, should we be preparing to contest the Euro elections in May? Um, I think there's a real possibility that that's where we're going, because I mean, if we want a people's vote, there will be an extension to Article 50 to allow that to happen, and I think we need to be ready, and Nigel Farage has certainly said that he's ready to put up a fight and come back with I think, another new party uh, to, put, to put forward his, his next chance of uh, a bit more fame, which is what he's really about. Um, and I think we need to be prepared to, to if, that, if nothing else, fight, fight the proxy war, if you like, uh, for the people's vote that's be coming soon after, hopefully. Thank you, Andy. Um, uh, Adam, sorry. Um, I, and here's a, a question which I think I'll, I'll give to any member of the panel who feels, uh, and this one's from Tom Dolan, and it's in terms of online infrastructure, what does the panel see the government seriously doing about bots, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, the, the bot problem that was serious in the last election campaign? Anyone want to go on? I'll jump in. My business is, I'm, I've got a software company, so uh, I'm... I'm quite involved with this sort of digital campaign as well in, in where I've come from. And I think the, the real answer is there's, there's nothing they can do. The, the, the bots will happen because all it is is someone on Twitter, whether it's automated or loads of people sat in a room somewhere um, typing away, they will happen. The only way you can counter that is by putting your own arguments out there, getting out, campaigning, and speaking to people. I think we, we put too much emphasis on um, I think the, the bots and so on uh, in the last referendum. Obviously, it's important, but 52% of the people in this country didn't vote because they were on Twitter or they, they saw tweets from a bot. And if you've just got to look at the demographics of who was voting Leave and who was voting Remain to see that the people who were persuaded are, are probably not on Twitter, they're probably not on Facebook. So. You know, you've got to take all that with a pinch of salt. It's nice to think there was some reason as to why we didn't win, and it was because the Russians were doing it or someone was hiding away uh, and sending angry tweets over to people. But I think the real way to campaign is go and speak to people. It's get on their doorstep and talk to them. Find out what their concerns are and address them. And that, that's, that's the way you do a, a real campaign. That's what we need to do. That's brilliant. Thanks. Anyone else want to...? Yeah, well said, Adam. Well said. Very well said. Um, I, exactly that. A lot of the Leave voters weren't on Twitter, weren't on Facebook, so they weren't actually hit by these um, troll factories or whatever you want to call them in St. Petersburg or wherever they happen to be in Russia. Um, but if you think back, the, the Stronger In campaign was probably one of the worst campaign, political campaigns that I've experienced in a long, long, long time. We barely even tried, folks. And we still got over 48% of the vote. They cheated, they lied, they overspent by 10% to get a 2% vote swing. We barely even tried. Imagine if we did all of the positives and we sold all the positives of our EU membership and the things that we enjoy and every, how everybody's life is positively affected by being a member of the European Union. The swing was only 685,000 people between leave and remain. That was the vote swing one way to the other. 
and we'd have taken it. Since 2016, over 800,000 older people are no longer on the electoral register. I think it's probably the most tactful way of saying it. Um, and over 70% of them voted to leave. There's over a million new younger voters who've turned 18, who've not just turned 18, but they've gone to their local authority and they've registered on the electoral register saying, I want to vote in the next elections. And over 70% of them voted to remain. Just on the demographics, we can swing that 685,000 and we can get another 5 to 10% on top of that very easily by running a very positive, smart campaign. On, on. Yes. Something to add. Since the referendum, I became British. Yes. So, <laughs> and as I did, so many of my friends did as well. So many Europeans, I mean. And uh, we, we, we are a force. We are the enemy inside, we call ourselves. <laughs> we wouldn't even bother to become British before the EU referendum. We were very happy with our ideas uh, and exercising our treaty rights. Now we are fully British. We will vote and we know that we won't vote for their party that supports uh, Brexit. <laughs> so there is always hope. I totally agree. But we need to work on the message. This is the main issue. When we knock on those doors, we have to have a strong message. And as Jason was saying, hitting on their heart is what we need to do. So when they were saying, uh, take back control, this, it was an amazing message. Everybody understood it. Everybody translated it uh, as they wished it. Uh, take back control of the borders, take back control of the economy. Take, they, they, they made it work as they wanted it. Uh, when, do you remember? What was the message of the Remainer? Do you remember it? Do you remember who was the figure that was uh, going around uh, each door on every TV? Do, do you remember who was that person, the charismatic person of the Remain? Was it David Cameron? <laughs> was, it, was it Theresa May? Who was? Honestly. And now, when I went last week to uh, a Labour, Remain Labour congregation in Manchester, and their uh, message is Brexit, is it worth it? And I was saying, honestly, is this what you came out with? Because if I go knocking on the door and they say, Brexit, is it worth it? They'll say, yes, it is, yeah. I said, honestly, can't we do better than that? After two and a half years, nearly three years, we can't do any better than Brexit. Is it worth it? I mean, I want to take back control. That is why I became British. I want to take back control of my children's future, of the environment, of what I eat, of, what, of the kind of clothes I wear, the quality, who makes them. This is what we have to look. Start with the message. We still, uh, we are not ready for a people's vote, guys. We have to be frank. I mean, we are becoming British. We are helping you. But we have to have a message that goes to people's heart. We have to wake up and do something more. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> I, I think... I think that's the passionate argument for uh, remaining in the EU. I have a question here for Lord Stonnell, um, which, um, and it's if, if, if there was a people's, and it's from Caitlin Senior, uh, and it's if there was a people's vote, why would Parliament be unwilling to allow 16 to 17 year olds a vote? Okay, well, the, the first point, it, this is a sequence of things that's got to happen. And one, part of that sequence is that enough MPs have got to come to the view that we're in such a cul-de-sac that we're going to have to have a people's vote. And that will be made up of people who still want to leave and people who think that we should remain and people with all sorts of different points of view. Um, but you need to remember that the attempt to get 16-year-olds the vote was made 
in the run-up to the 2016 referendum legislation being passed. And so was the attempt to get European Union residents in the United Kingdom. Uh, that was made as well. And that was opposed by the government and soundly defeated in the House of Parliament. Now, we got a new House of Parliament, you know, we had a general election. But the fact of the matter is that there isn't enough evidence to show that you could do that without a lot of people saying, well, if you're insisting on that, I'm not going to vote for a people's vote bill. You've got to maintain a consensus in a very tricky situation which has as many MPs on board as possible. Just, I mean, just to give you an insight into all those votes um, on the 29th of January, um, there was no actual vote on there should be a, a, a people's vote. It wasn't one of the amendments that was considered. And those of us who support a people's vote, I didn't have a part in deciding what would be discussed and what wouldn't be discussed, but the tactics of this are very clear. We get to that point when everything else has been exhausted. If we'd had that vote last Tuesday, then it would have been lost. You saw the votes that were lost, much less radical solutions than that were lost. So I'm sorry, but you're hitting the hard wall of real life and politics here about what can actually be delivered sometime in the next 54 days. And it's not palatable, but there's no point in me telling you it wrong. Thank you. The, the, the next point, thank you. Here's a question which I think may be for Jason. How will the service economy be affected by Brexit? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, I, I'd just like to follow on from what Lord Stunnell was actually just saying. Um, bear in mind, when we win the people's vote and when we decide to stay in the European Union, we have a lot of rebuilding to do in this country. And if we win the people's vote because we changed the franchise and we allowed EU citizens to vote, or 16 to 17 year olds to vote, then the, the, the levers will just bang on for the next 10, 15, 20 years saying, oh, you only won because you cheated, you changed the question. Um, so we, we have to keep the franchise the same to try and avoid that and try to rebuild and reunify this country that we live in. Um, services, the Canada plus Canada deal, the Canada EU trade deal doesn't cover services. Services is 80% of our GDP. Um, our economy, if you like, in the United Kingdom. Um, it's not covered under a Canada deal. So anybody pushing for Canada plus, plus, plus just doesn't understand what's going on. Um, the service industry is very mobile, very easy to move. Um, I think four out of our top 10 banks have already relocated their service headquarters outside of the, Europe, outside of the UK into the EU, um, ready for post-Brexit. These companies are not coming back. There's a lot of service companies that have shut down already. Um, there's a the Facebook group called Brexit Job Losses. And they uh, monitor, over the last couple of years, companies that are shut down for various reasons or jobs that have been lost specifically as a result of Brexit. Um, so far, we've lost 208,146 jobs have gone. Have a look at them. And you can see the companies that are listed there, the reasons why they shut down, the reason why those jobs have gone. because. They can trade within the European Union, the largest single market in the world, 27 countries, plus another 60 countries around the world where they've got trade agreements. They can continue to trade, and they can provide those services from within the European Union. Um, I did an event for um, Hewlett Packard Entertainment, and they do a lot of work with TV companies, broadcasters, um, movie manufacturers, all sorts of different kinds of organizations. And the BBC, you might have heard, are currently looking at Amsterdam and Brussels to, build, to set up a, a, a Europe-based Europe, EU broadcast centre because we won't be allowed to broadcast out of the United Kingdom post-Brexit with a no-deal Brexit. There's over 600 TV channels in the United Kingdom. Over 400 of those broadcast cross borders to Ireland, to Belgium, to France. And we can do that today as part of our services industries. They were talking about um, a billion, billion pound industry in Soho in London that do post-production for movies. And the way it works is you might have uh, a, a movie production team in Munich and they're filming Tom Cruise leaping off a building. Might be about a minute's worth of the, the whole entire movie. But that, then that, 
that piece of data, that video footage, is then piped to, across to Soho in London, uh, sent down through the internet as a service product. Um, the guys, the experts sit in Soho and they make Tom Cruise look a bit taller and maybe make him shaven or whatever they need to do, change the lighting, change the shadows, and they get paid for that service. And then that's then wrapped up into another product, which is then shipped to another EU country for, post, for further post-processing before it becomes a final movie. All of that stops. And that stops partly because of GDPR, which we talked about earlier on, because contained in that data file, that video file that's coming across from Munich, is all the personal information about the cameraman, the actors, the extras, the building, the location, his email addresses, contact details, none of which the United Kingdom is entitled to hold or receive post-Brexit. So that entire service sector in London, a billion pound industry, gone overnight. So that's just one part, but I mean, I could talk to you about some of the other sectors that we've talked to as well, but I, I know we're running out short I, on time. I'd be interested, but Adam, have you got more to add to that? Because you work in the service sector, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I've already received um, offers from Bavaria to go and set up in the tech capital of the EU, uh, video messaging, move your business here, uh, come and enjoy the Europe, and what will happen will be... No, I'm not. I'm, well, I've, I'm, well, not 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 decided. <laughs> See what happens. Um, so, what will happen is it will be a competition then between the UK and the rest of Europe as to who can offer the best for the companies that we've got. And you know, my company is effectively my staff and some computers. I mean, it's very easy for me to move anywhere. It's very easy for me to have staff in any part of the EU currently. Um, and it will be very easy for us as, as companies to just move. And we've got to, in, in order to keep going, we've got to do whatever's best for the, the, the company. Uh, obviously, whatever patriotic uh, ideals we may hold, if, if our company doesn't sell, if our company can't find staff, which is another big issue for my business, um, when I last did a job search for, to, to find some new staff, I think out of 10, I think half were EU citizens that came up in the search. So out of the 10 people I could potentially employ, half of those I wouldn't be able to anymore. Um, and and that, that's a big concern for a lot, of, a lot of tech industries because we just haven't put the investment into training over the years. We haven't got the people who've got the skills in the UK and that's not going to happen in two months. We can talk all we like about apprenticeships and what training programs we've got to do and uh, all these different centres for learning. But that's going to take years to, to put, produce. It's going to take years for people to come through the system. And in the meantime, the EU is going to outcompete us, they're going to be more productive, and our businesses are going to go under. That's great. I, I want to move on to another question now. Can, can, I, can I just really quickly, very, very quickly, Paul, quick point. You remember we talked about the schedule of tariffs for goods that we filed with the WTO that we copied from the EU? We haven't yet still filed a schedule of tariffs for services under GATS, and we still haven't filed a schedule of tariffs for agriculture products, only for goods. They don't, I don't know what they're doing at the Department of International Trade, but we're not there yet. Here's a question which I'll put to Christina first. and Because uh, I presume you're reading the probably read the, the, the media in Italy and direct. Um, well, here's a question from Twitter. Is, would, would the EU want us back? Yeah, of course. They're <laughs> said in 27 languages. Uh, they don't want us to leave and they want us to come back if we go. So, yeah, absolutely. The doors have always been open. Uh, I think it was Juncker that said, uh, we love you. I mean, we love EU as it is, the EU 28. The, the United Kingdom has drawn the Article 50. The United Kingdom has been the pillar of the European Union. This fact that the, uh, the British always talk about the Germans and the French like uh, a clique that um, they've done everything behind the doors, uh, we don't see it like that. We saw the British as... Uh, um, in the, w the, they were put in the balance. Uh, the, it's true there was the Germans and the French, but we all, now we are really, really sad that Britain is going. And now see, as we got Salvini in Italy. <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, it's a travesty. I was saying to Tom, we can't even go back to Italy, as we used to say, because it's a tra The only thing good with Salvini is that... that we hope that the another election so will bring something new. Uh, the Brexit is something very definite. It will take uh, another generation to go out of it. Uh, with an election, uh, 
considering the easy, Italy is even less than five years' time, probably. But well, we do love you. Well, that, that, that's very hopeful that the EU wants us back. So that's good. Or I don't want us to leave. Here's a question from Ted Longman, which I'll, Ted Longman, which I'll give to Lord Stonnell. And is, if, if we leave Europe, do you think it likely that Scotland will vote to leave the UK? Yeah, well, I mean, there's several uh, really serious issues there. I mean, I mentioned Northern Ireland and the complete disenfranchisement of the majority of people in Northern Ireland, uh, which for two years has not had its own administration and, and is in a parlous state from its governance point of view. Um, and yes, you're quite right. I mean, there's going to be a lively debate uh, in Scotland about when the moment is when they want to have a further referendum on independence. Um, I mean, it's the, the levels of um, complexity there are quite deep. We could have a little discussion about that, but I think it's inevitable that if we leave, the uh, argument in Scotland, which obviously voted to remain, collectively voted to remain, the argument will be that it would be much better for us if we were separate from England. Um, I mean, there are lots and lots of consequences of that, not all of which are predictable, but I think it will increase the pressure. I don't think it will be um, uh, absolutely decisive, but um, it's really ironic that it's the Conservative and Unionist Party which is struggling so hard to understand that if you want to keep um, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which quiz question is actually the longest name of a nation in the world, um, uh, uh, whether they're really committed to keeping it together um, and whether they quite understand what this process might do to disrupt that. Thank you. Well, it, it's, it's five to nine, and um, some of our panellists do have travel arrangements later. Um, so um, uh, I'm go we're, going, we're going to wrap up now, but I, I would like to give, I'd like us all to, you know, if we, I think we've had some really good speeches tonight, some very eloquent answers and insightful comments, and I think it would be just great if we could give all our panellists a big round of applause. And also, we are a grassroots campaign. We are looking to keep growing. Um, uh, and if we get a people's vote, we will need to know who's active and who's supporting us. So there are registration forms there. They're all GDPR compliant, uh, if you, <laughs> which is good European regulation, that. But if, if you sign up for that, um, you know, please make sure to hand in your form as be before you leave, because uh, we do want to know who you are, and we, we do want to see you again at some of our events. Um, and you can find us easily by Googling Chester for Europe um, I would, uh, on, on, on the internet. I would also say, you know, say we are a grassroots organisation. Um, there's no money parachuting from above. Uh, we do have donation buckets located strategically around the room. So, you know, please do donate. 50p a pound, 100 pound, whatever it happens to be, you know, we'll take it. Um, but above all, I would like to thank you, all of you, for coming tonight, because without, without you turning out tonight on this cold evening, this event, you know, just wouldn't have been a success. So thank, thank you, everyone, and thank you, our panelists.